thing you need to know about little Allie is that she was a peacemaker. Standing in the elementary lunch line, scoping out what there was for lunch, I grabbed whatever there was for hot lunch that day, grabbed an apple, a carton of milk, and like any first grader, I was dying to find a seat in the lunchroom so I could sit with as many friends as possible. When I finally got to the front of the lunch line, I was ready for the lunch lady to click my picture and charge my account. When I suddenly noticed that the picture that popped up on the screen was of another Asian girl behind me in the lunch line. So my goody two-shoes self did what any goody two-shoes would and I stopped her. What if that meant the other girl couldn't get her lunch or that I was charged incorrectly? The biggest question I had was, how could the lunch lady mix up two different students? It was a mistake. People make mistakes, right? But this gave my seven-year-old self a creeping feeling that this was much bigger than a simple mix-up. Why did I have to defend who I was? I never did anything other than correct her, though, because it was an honest mistake. This uneasy feeling came back, but this time it wasn't felt exclusively over simple mistakes. In middle school, I was called a cat eater. Now I had a cat, and I was an avid cat lover, but to say that I ate them was maybe going a little overboard. At 11 or 12, I went along with the joke. And that was the point of no return. I distinctly remember one of my middle school teachers telling my friends and I that it was wrong and racist to say these things. But I also remember telling her it was okay because I cared more about my friends' feelings than I did my own. I didn't want them to be labeled as racist. I could take a joke. What else could I do but laugh it off? But also, what if I didn't laugh it off? I was afraid of calling people out. I was afraid of losing friends. I endured these hurtful times, bit my tongue, laughed, put on a polite smile, all for the simple sake of belonging. I wanted to belong so badly that I was willing to let myself pay the price of the pain. I was willing to let myself be dehumanized and laughed at because keeping the peace was more important than my self-respect. I finally understood what my middle school teacher meant. These jokes were microaggressions, a subtle, indirect, or unintentional act of discrimination. And with them, it signaled my otherness. I was an outsider. The belonging that little Allie experienced is the belonging that peacemakers strive to achieve. They enter a space to neutralize the situation, find common ground, and resolve conflict. A peacemaker to make everyone else around me feel comfortable with my differences at the expense of my dignity, respect, and self-worth. I did everything in my power to fit in, belong, not make waves. But in this belonging, I truly felt alone and voiceless. And what peacemakers don't understand, what I didn't understand, was that complacency as a peacemaker was equally as harmful and unfair to not only myself, but to the empowerment and education of others in an increasingly diverse world. Eventually, I realized that peacemaking was not a solution to belonging. During my first winter break of my freshman year of college, I remember being so excited to finally get my senior yearbook. It had taken a while, but if it was going to be good, then it was worth the wait. It wasn't good. Uh, after scouring the whole book for all of the pictures and memories that I had made during my senior year, I stumbled across several not-so-simple mix-ups. In that moment, I was angry. I was mixed up with a Vietnamese student in my senior yearbook. After being called the wrong name time and time again with this same girl, after being stopped in the grocery store and asked if I worked at the local Chinese restaurant or if my mom worked at the nail salon, after 
being approached by random strangers who had the audacity to greet me with ni hao. After being constantly approached just for my homework, I'd finally had it. I was done with the jokes and going along with it. I didn't, I wasn't good at math. I didn't speak Chinese. And this girl's face didn't look remotely similar to mine. Even after speaking about these incidents, they were reduced to just a joke. Silly, cute reminder, a moderately racist mistake. In this moment of anger, there was also a moment of realization. My feelings didn't matter. Belonging to me now means striving for equity and justice through accountability and acknowledgement. It is being accountable for our words and actions. It is continuing conversations and letting go of guilt. The transformation from peacemaker to changemaker is not as simple as reading a book or diversifying what the room looks like by hiring more people of color. It is more than knowing the definition and having more representation. Diversity comes organically. We need to focus on inclusion because the systems that we have now will not support the diversity to that is to come. And according to the Brookings Institute, by the year 2045, the US will become minority white. So let's focus on inclusion now. Becoming a change maker requires a journey of having new experiences, keeping an open mind, having empathy, getting to know ourselves. So here are my seven steps to becoming or to start your journey from peacemaker to change maker. First, you need to know yourself. And that starts with be, being unapologetically you. Be all of you. People deserve to know who you are, not any watered down version. Embrace your culture because that is embracing your identity. But also we need to recognize our bias and privilege. Everyone has some, some type of privilege. For example, I am an adoptee adopted into a white family subject to the model minority myth of being smart and quiet. I have an adopted sister. I get to go to college, I'm able-bodied, and the list goes on. Recognizing our bias, or recognizing our privilege allows us to dismantle the systems that don't allow others to thrive in the same environment. It also allows us to learn more about the community, uh, different communities' histories. We also all have some type of bias. We make snap judgments every day because it's a survival instinct to be able to rely on our quick assessments of our situations. Within the first seven to 12 minutes of meeting someone, we make a multitude of snap judgments, and in them we're prone to bias and mistakes. What we have to recognize is that we cannot assume anyone's experience based on outside identity alone. Similarly, we can't assume the impact on someone's life based on only one experience. To overcome this, we must shift our perspectives. How do we do that? We must have respectful curiosity. We must surround ourselves with different perspectives. Strive to not only know the surface level struggles of a community, but also strive to educate yourself more about the community by going to events, volunteering, or making new friends. And by doing that, by getting more involved, you're able to listen and uplift. Listening is a crucial part of being a change maker, whether that being listening to your friends, family, peers, mentors, or communities as a whole. It goes beyond listening though. We must actively uplift and live out those voices. The next step is center your why. Why are you wanting to become a change maker? For example, we could ask why companies you and I were jolted to react by the BLM movement whether that be why companies started writing diversity statements or why we all started posting black squares. Why did we do that? And what did your why center? If your why was not to be racist, sexist, 
homophobic, fill in the blank, then we need to recenter our why. Our why should be centered around community and diverse voices. It is not solely self-improvement. My why is community. It is being the person that I needed, and it's being the person that paves the way for others, for my sister, friends, mentees. My why has also encouraged me to use my voice. Use your voice. It is so powerful, you don't even know it, even if you think no one is listening. The little things matter. Giving someone validation, information, or a new perspective could change their whole world. Speak up for and with others who cannot or burnt out. We need to overcome our fear. It's the most challenging part, but you are not doing it alone. I'm not doing it alone. We are all paralyzed by belonging. We're afraid of making mistakes, being the minority in the room. We're afraid of hurting others' feelings. We're afraid that we don't have time to intentionally listen. Change comes with fear, but that doesn't mean it's a bad thing. Finally, show up and stay accountable. The journey to allyship is not a one and done thing. It can't be reduced to a checklist. Keep showing up and staying accountable. Keep learning and listening. Be advocates, whether that be in the classroom or in the whole community. Because every day we should strive to be change makers. Our journey is ongoing. It's something we practice together. I want to leave you with a quote from Michelle Mi Jung Kim. Our waking up to other suffering is not enough. Change requires that we wake up to ourselves, our co power, our complicity, and our capacity to transform ourselves and the world around us. Your transformation could make all the difference for a fellow peer, coworker, student, even the person sitting right next to you. It takes one change maker to change the world. So wake up. Thank you.